How do psychopaths tell on themselves, and how can we recognize a psychopath? In this video, I'll analyze a disturbing article by Keith Raniere. We'll also watch a few clips from actress Alison Max revealing interview with Raniere before his and her arrest. So stay tuned, this is gonna be interesting. Keith Raniere co-founded a company that offered so-called personal development seminars for women. Using the slogan, Female Empowerment, Raniere created a subgroup within the company called DOS, a Latin abbreviation of Master of the Obedient Female Companions. Masters were assigned obedient servants, and the servants were expected to recruit other servants so that they could become masters themselves. Raniere was the grandmaster of and only man in this pyramid. Only inner circle members, such as Ellis and Mac, knew that Raniere wasn't only associated with the group, but also controlled the group. Thus, DOS members were literally branded with Raniere's initials, without knowing it was his initials. Servants were expected to obey their masters 24-7, no matter which task they were ordered to do. Servants endured derogatory language and various forms of discipline. In his attempt to keep members from leaving or talking about the group, Raniere collected collateral on each of them. The collateral included damaging personal information, revealing photos, and rights to personal assets. At its core, the word psychopath refers to a person who has no regard for other people's feelings or even existence. Because psychopaths don't have emotional empathy or feel remorse, their ruthlessness knows no boundaries. Raniere's article appeared in a Spanish magazine long before his arrest. He's writing in third person, trying to make it sound like he's speaking on behalf of someone else, most likely the devil. The title is Sympathy for the Devil. Start by imagining that you have very low self-esteem, an individual who feels entitled to things. You expect everything, you aren't willing to give anything, and because of that, you feel great bitterness. Raniere is telling us that the world isn't enough for him, that because he expects everything to be handed to him, he feels bitter when he doesn't get it. Not only does this show us his extreme entitlement and grandiosity, it also shows us that this extreme entitlement and grandiosity were prominent personality traits early on. Raniere is the only child of a father who was an advertising executive and was often absent from the home, and a mother who was a dancing instructor. Nothing in life seems to come out as you want. You constantly feel you're a victim of others and of circumstances. The adverb constantly intensifies his experience and lets us know that he's never stopped and isn't going to stop blaming people for what is really his own grandiosity. Psychopaths always resort to victimhood. Nothing can ever be their fault, because that wouldn't fit their high self-perception. Raniere's entitlement is so extreme that he writes about the idea of engaging in self-esteem activities that require effort as ruled out and unpleasant. He writes that he engages in carnal activities, which he can't imagine spending more than a few minutes without, even though he knows it doesn't do him any good. This shows a lack of impulse control and ability to delay gratification, which corresponds to the way he interacted with the women in DOS. The words you can't imagine make it sound like his urges control him rather than the other way around. This is hyperbolic language used for dramatic effect. Psychopaths are very much aware of what they do. They aren't psychotic, so he should be able to imagine it, just like everybody else. But that's the point. He doesn't think he's like everybody else. He thinks he's special and superior, or at least that's how he wants people to perceive him. He writes, Now imagine that you reach a point where nothing, not even satiating yourself, can ease your discomfort. You're surrounded by darkness and endless desolation. You feel upset, disgusted, unpleasant, and hopeless. The last hope dies in you that you could ever feel good and alive again. This passage is one big pathos appeal, appeal to the reader's emotion and pity. However, unintentionally, the passage actually speaks volumes about his deviant personality. He writes that not even satiating yourself can ease your discomfort. 
These words are interesting, as satiating yourself isn't and shouldn't be considered an appropriate and, most importantly, lasting way of easing discomfort. Still, it's the only one he mentions. In order to truly ease discomfort, there needs to be an internal transformation, one that requires effort, the exact kind of effort he finds unpleasant, a word he likes to repeat and which suggests a hedonistic outlook on life. So, again, this passage is supposed to appeal to people's emotion and pity, but it ends up revealing his shallow and egotistical thinking instead. As in the previous passages, he makes frequent use of the verb feel, feel hopeless and feel good. This verb underlines his sense of self-importance. The important thing is how he feels about himself and how he can use other people to make him feel about himself, not how other people feel about themselves or about him. This point is crucial as we now move on to some of the darker passages. He writes, you try the first drop of an exquisite nectar. This drop, an initial act of pure destruction against humanity, marks its first divine glimpse of anti-conscience. The nectar he's referring to is his desire to commit acts of destruction, and the word initial implies that there will be other and more serious acts down the road. In Greek mythology, nectar is the drink of the gods, so it's no coincidence that he uses the word divine in his immoral praise of anti-conscience. He's calling good evil and evil good. You find an infinite amount of nectar, and the more you taste, the better you know everything, he writes. This is a spin on the story about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how he ate, or in this case drank, from the tree, but how the knowledge he got from it still wasn't enough for him. You're not satiated, as he puts it, again emphasizing the importance of his own urges, his own hedonism. So, even when he drinks like the gods and is associated with the divine, it's still not enough. This is more than just an inflated ego, because he speaks from a place above the divine. How even his twisted understanding of the divine bores him and thus is beneath him. This is the same kind of vanity as in the stories about the devil, Raniere's role model. He writes, what develops is the deepest addiction with the most intimate roots. He doesn't write, I develop, or in this context, you develop, but what develops. By using what as an impersonal and generalizing pronoun, he's making this sound like an inevitable development. That he's not in control of this addiction, as he deceptively calls it. Once again, this is him evading responsibility and emphasizing the power and control that are crucial to psychopaths. In this case, the power to destroy the happiness of others, the ability to dominate all those who still have a conscience. The presupposition in this statement that he no longer has a conscience confirms our previous suspicions. However, was it ever really a process, a gradual thing? Judging by his word choice in the beginning, how he's always felt entitled and didn't want to make an effort, it appears that he's never had a conscience. In this passage, he continues to make it sound like a process, writing that this virginal alteration of the brain can never be repeated. Was his brain ever truly virginal, though? It's highly doubtful, because his language indicates that his mind's always been contaminated, blinded by envy. He writes, once you have accepted the anti-conscience feeling, power consumes your life. Another reference to his feelings, how important they are to him, as opposed to other people's feelings. With the destruction of your conscience, you lose all hope, and when you lose all hope, you lose all humanity. The conscience and humanity he never had in the first place. Without humanity, there's no guilt. You don't care about others. The only thing he should have added here is, and I never did. Psychopaths don't make sudden and drastic changes. Their behavior and thought patterns stay relatively consistent throughout their lives. The red flags might be different at certain stages of their lives, but they're still red flags. You don't care about lying, cheating, stealing, or any other form of destruction. That's exactly what he did. Lied to his members, stole their money and things that are much worse than that. It's possible to be the greatest Machiavellian in the world. He wears this predicate like a badge of honor. 
Machiavellianism denotes cunningness, the ability to be manipulative, and a drive to use whatever means necessary to gain power. This article is an accurate reflection of how Ranieri ran his business. He never cared about people's personal development. He never cared about empowerment. I think this is a reminder to all of us not to get carried away by the nice-sounding slogans and buzzwords we hear in the media, in advertising, etc. It doesn't mean that all the people working in these companies are psychopaths. It means that the tactics they use are definitely Machiavellian. Machiavellianism is comparable to psychopathy and narcissism, and all three are present in Ranieri's writing. Psychopaths enjoy telling on themselves like Ranieri does in this article. They act like they're talking about someone else, but leave enough clues for people to realize that they're probably talking about themselves. They enjoy being feared, which ironically stems from a place of deep insecurity and bitterness. In his interview with Alice and Mac, it becomes clear that Ranieri is a pseudo-intellectual. At no point does he give a concise and straightforward answer. On the contrary, he gives long-winded, almost evasive answers, acting like an intellectual. This is typical psychopathic behavior, playing different roles and acting knowledgeable in areas they don't know much or anything about. Ranieri graduated from a polytechnic institute, having failed or barely passed many of the upper-level math and science classes he boasted about. But this doesn't stop him from speaking authoritatively about the nature of creativity, of course. I know for myself there are moments in time when I feel like mm -hmm. creatively abound, and then there are other times when I just feel like a, the most boring person on the planet, I can't come up with anything. Mm. And I was just wondering if you could explain sort of your take on the nature of creativity. Ranieri then speaks for the next seven minutes. We won't listen to all of them because it's quite unbearable. Notice the shallow name-dropping of philosophers and shallow mentions of different concepts such as free will. What we're about to hear gives the term psychobabble a whole new meaning. Yeah, well, I, I normally speak of science and creativity as sort of being somewhat opposite, but they're, they're not real. I mean, inherent in science is this notion that we can have free will, and there's even in science things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that, that talks about our limits and how we can observe things. And, and if it seems to have free will, we see it as things, things, parts of it that are not predictable and thereby creative. It creates. It is the thing that comes from it is not a function of that which comes before mm -hmm. in any way that we can predict. There's a, a saying that talent, it's by Schopenhauer, talent hits the target and genius hits the target no one else can see. <clears throat> you know, so for example, if someone's just being lazy, some people think it's creative. Yeah. There's a lot of things like that. Our whole experience of the universe, whether it's Beethoven or the stars or redness, is personal to us and right now stands behind an impenetrable veil. But one could say that the essence of creativity is biopoiesis, which is the creation of life. Here we have this inanimate planet. We have all these different chemical sort of things going on, this environment. It holds itself out against physics. Mm -hmm. You know, life maintains itself in a certain way that non-life doesn't. So creativity seems to sprout out up out of nowhere. He tries to sound like a philosopher, and he gesticulates as if what he's saying is deep and complicated, when in fact it's just seven minutes of disorganized thought. Next, we observe the manipulation that comes so naturally to psychopaths. He knows just what to say to make certain personality types emote. He's talking about authenticity, the very thing he knows he's lacking which could be the reason why he enjoys talking about it, to see if she believes his authenticity. Authenticity has no additional layers of artifice, no trying to be something that you think you should be. It's just a pure state of being. Mm -hmm. So one would say authenticity is being as you are. So when someone's being authentic, you get the feeling that not only that there's a person there in the moment, 
but somehow you you reach into their very essence and you you meet a unique individual. Mm. I don't know why that makes me want to cry. It's beautiful. Well, I think, it's sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, but why? Why do you think that's so emotional for me? Yes, I don't know. I think because it seems like it's a um, something that I just I feel like I want it um, authenticity, and I and I I think I what mean, do you want about authenticity? This clip's a testament to how we lured people into DUS, acting concerned about their well-being, asking them questions as but if why, he had the credentials of a psychologist. So yes. In all things, discernment is crucial. A lot of people look at this and go, how can anybody fall for this? A lot of people are capable of looking at different types of deception and immediately realize that the person's performing and isn't being genuine. However, a lot of people evidently, probably even most, can't. They fall for the slogans, the smiling, the acting. To me, the scariest thing in the world is when people who have some level of discernment and deep down know that something's fake, choose to ignore this knowledge. They ignore it because it matters more to them how they feel about what's being said than if it's true. It's always scary when a person chooses feelings over common sense. It's this illogical choice that's ruined a lot of things in this postmodern society. Ranieri isn't the first cult leader, and he certainly won't be the last. But we don't have to be victims of deceivers, as long as we're aware of the science of deception. For more about that topic, check this video. Links in the description. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe for more videos.